G'day, everyone. Ooh. I got a weird That's announcement you. just there. <laughs> um, g'day, everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and welcome to Australia Institute TV and our webinar series. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that Canberra is Ngunnawal country and that sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to uh, traditional owners past and present. Uh, I acknowledge that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land and I want to thank all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders for more than 60,000 years of caring for country. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we do these webinars every week. In fact, we've got three this week. This is one of three. So we've got today's poll position webinar. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. That'll be at three o'clock. And on Friday, we'll have Pete Lewis back again to talk with the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo, about artificial intelligence and where Australia needs to be drawing some of those lines. Uh, so a reminder that you can find all those details on our website at australiainstitute.org.au. And thank you so much for joining us again today. Just a few tips before we kick off on poll position. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a QA and a function. You can type in questions there for all of our panellists and you should be able to upvote questions from other people and also leave comments. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded and we'll post a copy of it, uh, of the video up on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel and we'll email it to people after this discussion. So today, again, we're more, we're so delighted to be back with Pole Position, formerly known as Political Geek Fest. Um, and it's a new Australia Institute TV program to give you the inside scoop on what's going on in Canberra and what the public uh, actually thinks, not what the politicians say that they think. I want to welcome again everyone joining us from Guardian Australia and from Australia at Home, the former home of uh, Political Geek Fest, and all the regular viewers. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the latest political polling trends revealed in the fortnightly Guardian Essential Poll. So I'm delighted to welcome back Catherine Murphy, political editor of Guardian Australia, Pete Lewis, the executive director at Essential Media, Richard Dennis, the chief economist at the Australia Institute, and the numbers man, John Remington from Essential as well. Uh, so let's dive in, Pete, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ebony, and hi, everyone. Um, and we've got a really interesting report today. It was in the field um, straight after the budget. So two weeks ago, we had our initial poll position at the ungodly hour of 10 a.m. And um, Catherine went into the lockup and then we saw, um, it, it's very interesting to see a before and after on, on some of the expectations of that budget. And so we've, we've asked a number of questions around that, which we'll go into in a few moments. But before we get in, we always start this discussion with a bit of a, How's it going down in the big house? And so, Catherine, just give us a taste. It's the second of a two-week sitting, I believe. Um, first, yeah. First, first of, of a two-week two sitting. Um, but who's counting? Yeah. So first what's, of what's hot? What's hot? Um, well, it's it's very busy. These are these two weeks are generally two of the most busy uh, political weeks of the year in terms of just parliament and process because. We have the House sitting and we also have Senate estimates, uh, which is sort of ro rolling constantly in the background. And this Senate estimates process is uh, about interrogating the budget and 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 much more. Uh, so, um, yeah, so they're all back. Parliamentarians are back. They've been in their party room meetings today. Uh, the focus of estimates today has been an appearance by Phil Gaitens, who's the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, he has faced a lot of questions about where his investigation is up to uh, into, uh, well, I'll, I'll take one step back. Um, the Prime Minister at the height of the Brittany, the Brittany Higgins story asked Gaitens to check what his staff knew about the sexual assault allegation prior to February, middle of February this year. Gaitens embarked on that process and it was paused for about a month uh, while uh, the Australian Federal Police were pursuing the criminal investigation. Uh, so what we've learned this morning is that the AFP is now very close uh, to sending a brief of evidence to the Director of Public Prosecutions in the ACT about this rape allegation. So it looks like the Higgins uh, allegation is heading in the direction of a prosecution. 
Uh, also, we've learned that, uh, well, <laughs> it's possibly better to say what we haven't learned. Um, Phil Gaitchens wasn't all that forthcoming um, about where his uh, various investigations are up to. Uh, because he said during today's hearing that he is uh, guaranteed or, or given prime ministerial staff a guarantee of confidentiality. Um, he wasn't clear when he would conclude, although he put the time frame at weeks rather than months. He wasn't able to say whether or not this report would be ever publicly released because it wasn't his report. It was a report he was doing for the prime minister. And so it went. Uh, Labor senators Penny Wong and... Uh, Katie Gallagher uh, sort of veered between incredulity and outrage, I think, for much of the proceedings this morning. Uh, so that's a that's a significant focal point of today, and that'll roll into question time in uh, just under an hour's time. Uh, and so, and there are other hearings around and about the place. But in terms of just the general state of play, Pete, um, obviously vaccinations is a big deal. Um, quarantine is still a big deal. Uh, and, and they are all issues that we've canvassed in uh, the poll this fortnight, which we'll get into. But that's the sort of, um, you know, that's the situation report on the events of yeah. today. So it's interesting. I've, I, I used to have a theory about the goldfish bowl, you know, the, the whole theory of goldfish never gets bored because yeah. by the time it gets around, it's fresh again. And I always used to use that to um, one day cricket. You could never remember the following, the previous year's um, series. But it feels that we're almost in goldfish bowl politics in that Brittany Higgins and the whole, that whole issue was intense, went off the boil. It's back on yep. the boil. The budget was intense for a week. It's gone off the boil. Do you feel like you are in that goldfish environment sometimes where things just, wow, and then down, up again, <laughs> down again? You know? Yeah, it, it, well, it's kind of like it's a good description of political reporting, really. Um, yes, these issues kind of revolve around and about Sometimes it's like a submarine, they submerge for a while and then boom up, they come again. And, um, but it, we're sort of, uh, you know, I think your point is that we're sort of in a, in a hierarchy of the same issues that are going around and around at, this, at, the, at the moment. And that's certainly right. Yeah. And a breakout. Um, Richard, how's your goldfish bowl been? And um, it's been a good two weeks since budget. What shouldn't we be forgetting about the federal budget? No, no goldfish bowl. We're in uncharted territory here. You're a bit quiet there, Richard. Lift your... Uh... Oh, sorry. Um, no goldfish bowl here. Uh, we're in uncharted territory. The submarine is, uh, as Catherine referred to, is a great metaphor, but this budget sub, it's, it's popped up where it's never been before. After, after seven years of being told we had a budget emergency, that the number one thing we needed to do to manage the economy was to have a, run a budget surplus and pay the debt down, that's, that's all not just completely gone, uh, but we're now heading for a trillion dollars of debt, uh, literally deficits as far as the budget can forecast, and there's nothing to worry about. Now, by the way, I agree, there's nothing to worry about. There was nothing to worry about before. Um, uh, you know, the, the last US president to deliver a budget surplus was Bill Clinton. The last UK prime minister to deliver a budget surplus was Tony Blair. It's a uniquely Australian obsession, the budget surplus. Uh, but it has defined our politics for so long. So I, I think the thing that we all have to hang on to, the thing we really have to remember is, uh, is that the, the course we were on was taking us in the wrong direction well before the crisis hit. The government has rightly done a big U-turn. That's great, but they're not very enthusiastic driving in this new direction. <laughs> and while we saw a lot of money spent, uh, for example, on aged care, we, we saw less than half of what the Royal Commission said we needed. So we had a whole Royal Commission to help us understand what we needed to make sure our grandmothers don't eat chicken nuggets every night. And we ignored that. We came up with another number. You know, so the, the big picture optics of the, polit of the budget are radically different, but the underlying ideas and values and sentiments haven't changed at all. And we'll talk about tax later, I'm sure. But... The government does have a plan, it, but the plan at the moment is to get re-elected and after it gets re-elected, it'll be Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey 2.0, slashing spending and slashing taxes. We've got a great question on plans that John put in the field this week that we'll jump into in a sec. Maybe we'll dive into the polling now. Um, 
and I'll just do my very, um, oh, I've got to hit the share. This is always my little bit noir. Um, so this week, let's start off with overall support for the federal government, which has been the high watermark. Um, this week, it's dropped off four points, which isn't everything, but if you look at the trend, particularly in those thinking the government's doing a very good job, it's down to, I won't be cruel and say J.D. Mackay levels, but it's down to 18% with 40% saying quite good. So still a majority of people giving it a tick, but compared to where it's been um, in previous, um, you know, for most of the last 12 months, Catherine, there's a little bit of a drop off. Um, now there's been a lot of noise around um, the, the, the vaccine rollout and the lack of a plan on quarantine. I suspect that's what we're looking at there. Mm, yeah, well, it's uh, again, we, we, we can't draw perfect lines between events and, and what's happening in the polls. Um, this is us theorising a bit, but it does make sense uh, because the government's had a rugged few weeks uh, both with community concerns being quite acute about the state of the vaccination rollout. And it's quite clear in some of the other questions we'll get to uh, over the course of this conversation that people at the moment are worried about quarantine and, this, and whether, whether there's sufficient readiness about quarantine uh, with obviously another winter to get through, uh, with uh, dreadful scenes that we've seen in countries elsewhere still playing out. So it makes, it makes intuitive sense that there would be a bit of a, 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 bit of a downtick uh, in support for the Commonwealth's response. There has been, I'm jumping ahead slightly, but there's been a bit of a downtick in the, or tick down, however one says that, um, about state leaders as well. Um, but Let's but do it's that not, now. Yeah. Yes, but it's not as significant as the Commonwealth did. And Victoria, well, yeah. up and Victoria said, and this is before the cases just uh, that, that are, uh, have been um, uh, brought into the public domain over the past 24 hours or so. That's right. And, you know, a, a, a catastrophic drop from the high 80s to the high 70s in WA will not be causing anyone to lose too much sleep. <laughs> the only, um, you know, I guess the interesting state just to be talking a little bit about is New South Wales, given the um, upper hunter by-election, I've argued in today's Guardian, it is the one seat that shouldn't be a litmus test for whether Labor's in a state of crisis or not. Other people have, have different opinions about that. But um, Catherine, is there much chatter about that by-election in Canberra today? I know there's one person that's been chattering about it a fair bit is the, the federal <laughs> member there, but... Um, yes, yes. Yeah, quite a lot of chatter from Joel Fitzgibbon. Um, no, look, I, that was one thing I did omit in my SIT report, which is bad. Um, yes, there has been a bit of chat around, obviously, in the wake of the uh, by-election result in New South Wales. Uh, Joel Fitzgibbon uh, has been very vocal, um, but that's not a new thing. Joel is often vocal and usually about these topics. Um, there has been uh, some pushback, though, both uh, from Anthony Albanese and from Pat Conroy, whose electorate adjoins uh, uh, Fitzgibbons, uh, just basically saying, look, this is nationals territory, has been for 90 years. Um, sure, we've got issues about connecting with uh, parts of our traditional base, but if, uh, you know, you've got to find a better litmus test than this one about how we're travelling. So that's sort of been the the Labor conversation, for what it's worth. Um, I mean, look, I should add as a proviso, though, that, um, you know, there is a certain amount of nervousness in the Labor, in Labor ranks about whether or not they are, I mean, just to be blunt, whether they've got any prospect of winning the next federal election, whether it's uh, late this year or early next, there is that persistent nervousness, even though our, um, the data that I don't like talking about, um, shows that Labor is within striking distance and, and certainly competitive, but there is this sort of perpetual nervousness. So a conversation like this week's never helpful to Labor. There's also been a quite an interesting conversation on the government side. Um, Scott Morrison's used the result as a little homily to say, look, uh, can't we do marvellous things when we're all united, when the coalition is all united, uh, which is a lovely sentiment, except... Funnily enough, Matt Canavan and Barnaby Joyce on the government side have been saying over the past 24 hours, well, we were in the upper hunter for most of that by-election 
and nobody wants a gas plant, which is what the Commonwealth intends to build, everybody wants a coal plant. So it's sort of like, you know, it is the season of atomic wedgies. You know, everybody is wedging everybody else, really. Um, and what does it all mean? Well, probably two-fifths of bugger all, really. Although if we want to get into the weeds, I think there are some things uh, associated with this result which uh, Labor will need to think about more, grapple with more. And the short version of that, I mean, because I won't drag us all into the weeds, but what we did see in this by-election contest was a resurgent One Nation vote uh, in New South Wales. We did see Mark Latham uh, campaigning very vigorously in this contest and bringing some organisation around their field operation in this part of the world. Um, Labor, I think, uh, in seats like this where there is a kind of, where there's a kind of core constituency of One Nation or shooters voters, would back itself to be able to harvest some of the preferences returning from the Shooters Party, but Labor, of course, will not do preference deals with One Nation. So um, I think they're just at a field level, just at an operational level, I think um, there are some issues here that Labor may need to grapple with in this part of the world for the federal election, because it is certainly true that the coalition is going to target the hunter, uh, regardless of when the, whether this election occurs late uh, this year or early next. Anyway, that's the short version. Um, Pete, I just uh, was going to ask Richard. Richard, I know you did a community forum um, in the Upper Hunter um, and talked quite a lot specifically about the economics of coal. Did you have any reflections before we move on to the next question? Yeah, look, I, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the Hunter Valley. Well, politics simplifies everything. You know, the, the reality is the Upper Hunter community is far more complicated than the Daily Telegraph would have you to believe. So, you know, 90% of people in the Upper Hunter don't work in the coal industry, 90% don't. Uh, and the idea that everyone up there just wants to get behind coal, yeah, it's a kind of yet another kind of fantasy story that, that, that Matt Canavan and Barnaby like to talk about. What I think is really interesting is that as the nationals and the coalition generally and Labor fight tooth and nail to win this tiny number of coal seats, the, the damage that they're doing to themselves everywhere else. I mean, Zali Stegall must be rubbing her hands together with glee, having watched the nationals uh, have uh, Malcolm Turnbull removed from a climate advisory body so that the so that Gladys Berejiklian and the and, and the Liberals could double down on coal. So, you know, let's just look at the electoral math. There's far more people that live in seats with no coal mines than there are seats with coal mines. Even in those coal communities, there's far more people work outside of coal than inside of coal. So we're kind of watching this death spiral where we went to the last election with, the late, with this by-election with both the Labor Party and the Nationals supporting the need to build 23 new coal mines in the Upper Hunter. Let's just say that again, supporting the need to build 23 new coal mines. Now, the major parties are both, no one wants to be the first one to break up, right? If Labor thinks if they quit first, they'll, they'll cop it forever. The Nats think if they quit first, that one nation will cut their lunch. So the Labor Party and the National Party are now kind of determined to be the last person there loving coal. We, we saw the IEA just say, we don't need new coal mines. We just saw the G7 say, we're not gonna finance any coal. So the two, like what's defined Australian politics for nearly a century is the two major parties are the ones that take foreign policy and economics seriously. And then we pretend that the minor parties and independents don't get it. Well, now it's the major parties just literally sticking their head in the sand and pretending that what's happening around the world isn't happening. And that's why you see minor parties and independents thriving. And uh, again, loving coal is bad for the Liberals in, in what were once blue ribbon Liberal seats. Mm. Yeah, Catherine, I, I guess it comes down to that pendulum or you know what we call in campaigning a theory of change, how you actually get to your objective and Labor needs to find seats on the pendulum at least they need to hold these seats in the Hunter. They need to find seats um, up the Queensland coast. And at the moment, that plan B of winning government in the cities in those traditional Liberal seats seems a bridge too far. So they are, I feel, a little bit snookered here. 
Yeah, it's certainly difficult. I mean, Richard's points are very compelling about um, the sort of smallness geographically of of this fight, right? That's that's playing out. But the problem is that Australian elections, certainly in recent times, are very close. So. Um, when it comes down to a handful of seats, then uh, people make calculations accordingly, I suppose. Um, and the problem is uh, Labor is not um, uh, picking up. Obviously, there have been sig significant swings um, in uh, blue ribbon Liberal seats in Metro contests over the last couple of elections, like, you know, so negative swings of 5%, 8%, against uh, Liberal incumbents, but I, I don't think Labor are going to get those seats. I think those seats will, if they're going to fall, will fall to Zali Stegel like independents. And then it becomes a matter of, in a minority government scenario, a penalty shootout, you know, who ends up with the prize. So it's, look, it's, um, it's, it's very complicated at the operational level. Like the, the, the rights and wrongs of this argument are, are absolutely clear. Uh, and uh, but the, at an operational level, it becomes complex. But anyway, I'm concerned we're bogging down here a bit on <laughs> on pet well, theory, we're on, not getting we're through on slide two. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, we will show our faces at some stage, folks, as well. Look, I guess let, let's go back to the the budget. I, for me, the one in, the most interesting line in the budget was actually that that said we don't see the borders reopening till midway through. Um, 2022 for all the the, the debt and deficit and um, targeted spending. Um, so the government's actually, I think Labor's been prosecuted in this case, it's got two jobs to roll out the vaccines and get quarantine going. This number is quite interesting that people clearly see quarantine as being a federal government responsibility. And it's been one where they have been trying to play a little bit of, well, you know, it's not all us. Um, this seems to be, if Labor's got any way through, one of the key criteria for the government to reach. It was really quite surprising they didn't throw some of the money at scaling up um, quarantine facilities across the country. Mm. Yeah, this whole sort of mud wrestle about quarantine is kind of fascinating, really, because a bit like the vaccination rollout question, which we've asked in the past, not, uh, not in this poll, but we have asked in the past, Certainly our sample is very conscious of the fact that this the vaccine rollout is a Commonwealth issue, federal responsibility, and quarantine is also a federal responsibility. They're not confused about it. They know exactly who's responsible. Um, as Pete says, it was a bit confusing in the budget why, given quarantine's a hot-button issue out there, why the government didn't scale up more quarantine facilities. Now, I think the government will um, uh, reach a landing point with the Victorian government about that Melbourne facility, I, I feel that's not far off. I think that they will probably reach some sort of a co-production deal on that centre. So maybe that will be something to allay concerns in the community. But the whole sort of weird kabuki play around quarantine can be simplified. I think that, you know, the, the, it's been, the, the feds, while ever it's hotel quarantine, while ever people come off planes and go into hotel quarantine, then the states are responsible if there are outbreaks. It's, that is a state issue. It's not a Commonwealth issue. If people go into quarantine, Commonwealth quarantine facilities, then the outbreak issue becomes a, becomes a Commonwealth issue. And I think that's partly why we've seen this sort of, um, well, failure to commit on the part of the Commonwealth, on the part of the Morrison government. They really don't want to assume that liability. They feel like they've got a lot of liabilities and they don't want to assume another one. But anyway, I think um, it's, it's just very interesting that, that there, the voters know exactly who's responsible for both of these issues. Yeah, Richard, the, um, the economics of the, the vaccines and the quarantine really in a way, are a discipline in their own right, aren't they? And, you know, what what are the kind of risk and rewards the government's thinking through when it's approaching these issues at the moment, do you think? <laughs> well, I don't think the politics and the economics have got much to do with each other. Let, let's talk about the economics first. Um, we're just talking about coal and how important coal is, and coal exports, coal jobs, blah, blah, blah. Um, Universities are enormous employers. They're enormous export earners. Uh, they create a lot of jobs in regional Australia and we've just shut down their exports. Like they're down, they're out, they're gone. <laughs> and 
Lots of people have lost their jobs, but that's different from a coal miner losing their jobs. There's a lot less export revenue because the foreign students aren't coming, but that's different from coal export revenue. Uh, it's all in regional Australia. There's a big impact in regional Australia. You can use a huge employers, but that's different, different, different. So the, the economic consequences of our failures with quarantine, our failures with vaccination are enormous. Uh, we've got whole export industries like tourism, whole export industries like higher education can't even begin to think about uh, firing up again. And we just don't talk about it because we need to talk about coal a bit more. Uh, and, and then there is, uh, you know, th there's a reason that, you know, business people travel a lot for work. There's a lot of work in dealing with and forming relationships with customers and suppliers and they take years and other countries are doing that at the moment and we're not. So we're not just missing out now we're missing out for years to come. Uh, and we're not talking about that because the politics have now shifted. The Commonwealth has realised that the state premiers were onto something with tough on borders. Obviously, these guys know how to be tough on borders. We would have thought in be. Australia, yeah? Yeah, it, exactly. It's a winning formula. I was surprised it took the Libs so long to figure it out because the state premiers, Labor and Liberal, were, were, were doing very well out of it. So... So now we've just completely flicked the switch. Morrison's messaging is, is all over the place. But, you know, I, I think, you know, I say this again and again, but it still shocks people. It's going to take Australia longer to roll out a vaccine than it took the scientific community to invent one. Like, this is, this is how broken our nation state is. This is how run down our policy capacity and our service delivery. No wonder we can't feed people in aged care when there's a national crisis that's costing us hundreds of billions of dollars. It takes us longer to roll the vaccines out than the scientists mm. to invent it. So, Catherine, where's the opportunity for Labor here? Like, it's not open borders, is it? Well, it's, I think... Um opportunities sort of I, I don't I don't know that I'd necessarily come at it that way although I know why you're asking me that um it's sort of like we I, I I'd put it sort of a bit more simply um we're sort of at a point in the electoral cycle where it is possible that the prime minister despite his protestations to the contrary will go to the polls before Christmas that is possible on uh on current they're certainly setting up um, they're certainly laying the ground to do that in the event that they determine that that is in their best interests, uh, understanding that prime ministers and incumbents control election timings. So um, Labor is very much on the clock now, electorally. Uh, we're sort of, uh, I think uh, Anthony Albanese has a football metaphor that I don't entirely understand, but it's got something about kicking into the wind in the fourth quarter. Um, and I mean, I watch AFL, don't get me wrong. Um, and I like AFL. Teams but, rarely uh, win when they kick into the wind in the fourth quarter. Well, um, is, it, is it into the wind or with the wind and with the wind? Well, you want the wind at your back usually, but yeah. The wind's involved. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Wind, it's like the fourth quarter and the bloody wind. It's a bit of wind, yeah. yeah the wind right so and it's true I mean football meta metaphors aside um it is uh it is it is game time now and uh and Anthony, Al Anthony Albanese has been very careful I think over the first two years of his leadership to not create what I would describe as the Bill Shorten problem and by that I mean he's been at pains to be not overly negative, not overly kind of combative. Um, he's sort of, he's just kind of set a, set a course where he hasn't wanted to uh, weigh himself down with negative community perceptions. So that when we move into game day, he's not weighted by everybody thinking that guy's too negative or that guy carps about too much or I don't like that guy or whatever else, right? Albanese has been trying not to do, to, to take on too much baggage. But getting to your point, which is vaccines and quarantine, um, what is the opportunity? Well, I'm not sure if it's an opportunity, but the fact of the matter is the government has, you know, had has had one major job this year, which has been the vaccination rollout. They are trying to fix it now. They are absolutely working hand over fist to try and fix it, but certainly the opening, uh, the opening um, down payments in that you'd have to say debacle or near debacle. Um, 
quarantine, there's this strange dynamic that I was talking about a minute ago where the feds don't really want to push into this area because they don't want the political liabilities, right? So uh, Albanese has been not negative, but I think in order to get themselves into the conversation and if they want to, you know, start to land some blows on the government, you're going to actually have to go the government's record on these things. You're actually going to have to prosecute um, the, uh, the failings of the record. Yeah. Um, and so, but that's the that's the choice they've got to make. And I can sort of almost looking at them, see them having this dialogue with themselves. When do you, when do you go hard? You know, uh, how hard do you go? What issues do you choose? And and that's anyway long winded, but that's what I think. Anyway, let's let's call the budget the beginning of the third quarter, with the view that the election's the final the final one. Um, a couple of slides I want to whiz through and then I will throw to both you and Richard for a bit of um, insight because I think this paints a really interesting picture. So the first thing is that this is a budget where the, the only cohorts where people think there are more, the impact will be more bad than good, if you like, which is terrible syntax, I know, is people on lower incomes and interestingly, you personally. Um, oh, and older Australians. So... For most of the cohorts, there are the sense is it will be more good than bad, although the largest is don't know. So I think that says two things. One is there's no real definition on this budget, but it is not, it's not scaring the horses in terms of, um, and I think women's a particular interesting one. John's got a fun fact on that. Um, younger Australians, average working people, um, although there are, problems in the areas that labor is traditionally stronger with people on lower incomes and older Australians. But the you personally, the budget isn't really talking to, to the majority of people. It's not a cash splash in terms of tax cuts or anything. So it says to me that, that um, my take would be that the budget is landing in a fairly um, benign um, to a benign um, audience. But John, Bringing you in, the big stat we thought was interesting this week was the difference in um, the attitudes of men and women on whether this was a good budget for women. Yeah, so whilst overall we've got 40% of people saying it was good for women, perhaps surprisingly or not so, more men thought it was good than women than women themselves. <laughs> So it was forty-seven percent of men thought it was good for women compared to just thirty-four percent of women. God love us. We're, who said we don't support women? I'm shocked. So the second one, which I think goes to some of Richard's points, um, these statements about the budget: fifty-eight percent say it places unnecessary burden on future generations. Only thirty percent say it will keep debt under control. I kind of want to know what those thirty people studied at uni. Um, and then, help, but but the counterbalance is that over fifty percent say that the budget will help Australia recover from the economic impacts of COVID nineteen. So there's kind of an upside and a downside to the extra spending. And on these numbers, both those messages are are hitting home. So mm. don't know if you want to reflect on the debt bit there, Richard, before we go to my favourite slide of the day. Yeah, no, I'd combine the two. I think the fact that people kind of think positively about the budget but don't think it helps them uh, presumably means that most people think that it's helping someone. It's helping the abstract thing called the economy uh, as opposed to them personally. So, uh, so I think that's interesting that everyone's not kind of feeling the love but they've heard the message that someone's getting the love. And I think this is a big opportunity for Labor is to talk about you know, basically who the beneficiaries are, you know, Harvey Norman did well, the unemployed didn't sort of thing. So people have kind of turned the corner with the government. They're happy to cut them some slack on spending a lot of money and running a big budget deficit. They want to believe it's going to work, um, but they don't really understand who's getting it. They think they know it's not them, but they think someone else is and they're kind of willing to go along with that. And then there's the deficit stuff, which I think is really interesting, the debt and deficit stuff. I mean, leaving aside the sort of eight years of lying about it, um, clearly the public want to hear that the government has a plan, right? What the, what's going to happen? How are we going to pay it off? How are we going to come out of this? And of course, the government does have a plan. After the election, it's planning to cut taxes enormously for high income earners, the stage three tax cuts will literally give $9,000 a year to people earning over 200 grand. So the government's got a plan to make the deficits a lot bigger. 
The government's got a plan to make the debt a lot bigger and the public don't want to hear that and they aren't hearing it now. So we know that the government has a plan, cut taxes further, and that's going to mean enormous spending cuts down the track. So the public are saying, we'll wear this now, but we want to know the plan. But the government's plan is to keep the plan secret for at least another year. And, and whether or not Labor and others can drag that out of the government and force people to realise that, you know, with enormous spending, with, with enormous tax cuts still coming down the line, the only way to square this circle for the government is to cut spending enormously somewhere, um, that's, that's going to get messy. Yeah, Catherine, that whole um, idea that the, the coalition has basically got no plan to manage debt except makes it bigger, but it's almost a free pass because of the, um, the orthodoxy that Labor is the one that has a problem with debt and managing the economy. There's, there's a sense maybe of injustice there, but also the real politic that whether Labor goes, you're spending too much, the response is, well, Labor will always spend more or you're not spending enough that shows why you can't trust Labor with money. It's like there doesn't seem to be a way through on debt for me, but I don't know if you've seen any valiant attempts to find one from any of the Labor team. No, I think Richard's point is is quite right, I think, in the sense of um, I, I do think there is an opening because uh, it is entirely unclear how um, this important but entirely unfunded spending in the budget on social services is, is going to be acquitted for over the life of the budget. It is entirely un, unclear how that will happen. Um, I, there is a high probability that once uh, we're out of the pandemic and out of the economic uh, shock associated with it, that uh, that the austerity, you know, the spending merchants will, re will return to being austerity merchants. Um, I think there are legitimate questions a Labor opposition can put in the mind of the public about uh, well, what are the secret cuts. Uh, I think I think that's a legitimate question to raise, but whether or not it's got saliency in the current environment or saliency in the current environment is open to question because if we sort of look at our numbers, people are worried a bit about the government or not really understanding what the plan to get back to surplus is so it's like it's not a non-issue but people are fully supportive of expansionary fiscal policy at the moment because they think it's going to help us get through the crisis so the whole the conventional rules of the discussion are are different in this campaign than they have been in every other campaign that i've ever covered in my reporting lifetime and uh, I think there's a certain amount of confusion, both on the government side and the Labor side, about how the new rules work, frankly. Mm. I think both of them are kind of scratching their head about, you know, how much can we get away with? How much can we get away with? It's it's sort of, yeah, I think everybody is kind of not really sure how these new rules work. Um, Pete, I wonder... Okay, I'm just going to go to of, one... Yeah, and then we should go slide. to questions. Absolutely. This is my favourite slide of the week, actually, gang because this is my Hail Mary slide. We went to a range of the pressing issues the nation's facing from the rollout of the vaccine to aged care to reopening borders. And we asked people to choose one of three, whether they're confident the government has a long-term plan and they know what it is. Secondly, the government's got a plan, but we don't know what it is, um, or there isn't a plan. And as you'll see from these numbers, a significant number of Australians kind of think the government's got a plan on most things, but they have no idea what the actual plan is. Now, this to me says the government's done a great job of creating a sense of, of trust that government can solve problems. But with some of these areas, I think it also opens up the real Achilles heel that as the game moves into the um, deep into the third quarter and into the final stanza, Catherine, that um, Labor can capitalise on because objectively I'm not sure if that faith for instance the 43 percent who think they've got a plan to reduce national debt actually um that that faith is um in good hands mm. well it's sort of it, the the interesting bit about this is is uh, is the middle is the middle quotient yeah. with, who suspect there might be a plan but haven't got a bloody clue what it is um, and so it's sort of both good and bad. As Pete says, it's kind of like there's a sort of, there's a kind of blind trust there, which is 
pandemic related, like trust has improved over the course of the pandemic. So there's there's a bit of trust there. But there's also a like, what are these guys actually on about? Like there's a very clear message there in those in those particular in those questions and the responses to it. There's a whole segment of the community that thinks, well, this government hasn't got a plan at all. Then we've got a segment of the community that thinks, oh, maybe they do, but I'm buggered if I know what it is. And if I were the government, I wouldn't, I wouldn't love that at this point in time. I, wow. it, if you could combine that that bottom line and the middle line, you've got a compelling majority going, where's the plan? Well, that's so the that's thing. the opportunity. Yeah, and that's sort of what I picked up in my news coverage this morning. It's kind yeah. of like, this, where's the plan? Um, and uh, and that's sort of, um, the, the, yeah, there is, there is opportunity there for the government's opponents, I think, yes. Are you a plan man, Richard? Uh, look, plans are overrated, but public, like the voters love them. Like you're not allowed to say, we've got no idea what's going to happen in this global economy in the next 10 years. We want <laughs> we to... Play chaos football. Yeah, well, but it kind of, I hate to say it, that's, that's actually what happens in the economy. I mean, no one, no one had a plan to roll out mobile phones. There was no national plan to, you know, train mobile phone technicians and to install things. Like, you know, this is what markets actually do. So you, you can't tell voters that. You can't say we don't have a plan. Everyone has to pretend to have a plan. And then, of course, the plan blows up in their face. Um, so... Yeah, look, voters want to hear that there's a plan. It's remarkable, for example, for me, that when it comes to COVID, that uh, people are sort of saying, oh, I'm confident the government's got a plan for vaccine and COVID, and they're not telling me. But the whole point of vaccination is to tell them. So, <laughs> like, how, how does that even work? Like, oh, yeah, I, I probably should get vaccinated at some point. No one's told me when or how that works, but I'm confident they've got a plan. What's the point of keeping it well, secret? Yeah, I think funny. that middle rung is actually the political capital the government's built up over yep. the last 12 months mm -hmm. from following expert advice and locking the borders down and doing all that stuff they did last year, which people liked. But that is the bit that can be run down really quickly. And if you're Labor, you're saying that's our opportunity, I reckon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Ebony. We might go to questions now, to if that's questions. all right. Yeah. Uh, we've got a few... Oh, oh. Yeah, we've got a few here um, and they touch on a couple of things that we've talked about today. Um, but the first one I was um, going to ask was from Tony Walker, who says, what are the economic imperatives Morrison will be considering regarding setting an election date? And can we expect that the Liberals, should they be re-elected, uh, re to return to a monetarist? I'm not sure that that's a word. Is that that's a, a word. word, Richard? Bit, bit, of, <laughs> bit, of, a, bit, of, a, bit of a kind of babble there, Eb. <laughs> um, uh, look, I mean, big picture, I mean, there's lots the government has to consider, but for the economy from, you know, one of the big things they've got to think is, do they think things are going to get better or worse? Everyone's assuming things are going to get better and, you know, that's, that's kind of nice. But we've snapped back, so to speak, from, from the depths of the recession faster than most people thought. It wasn't the economy that snapped back uh, sort of of its own volition. It's because we poured $300 billion into it, right? So the economy certainly recovered faster than I thought because the government spent about three times more than I thought it would. So the economy snapped back, tick, well done, great. But it snapped back to a growth path that's a lot lower than the one we used to pretend we were on. So we've had low wage growth for a while. Uh, we've had low productivity growth for a while. The government in the budget always forecasts that it would get better. Well, those days are over. Now we're forecasting it's not going to get better. So we've snapped back. Good. Actually got dragged back by enormous fiscal stimulus. So if the government thinks, wow, things are going to grind on, wages aren't going to rise, unemployment's not going to fall much further, uh, then you'd be tempted to go early, especially before the consequences of scrapping JobKeeper kick in. Uh, but if you think things are going to pick up, then uh, I think you'd hang on. So uh, I'm still in the election next year camp, but I know that camp's getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> Catherine, what do you reckon are the chances of an early election? Uh, look, I think they're certainly setting it up. They're, set, they're, they're setting it up uh, to give themselves the option to go, um, uh, and but they may not. It, it, like the only thing that's constant about when an election gets called, it, it, it gets called either, well, there's two constants, either, either, either a government runs out of time and has to go or 
they try and sequence when they go to, you know, maximise their chances of winning. So the the only constant here is that Scott Morrison will go when he thinks he's got the best chance of winning, and that could be later this year or it might be early next. Yeah, yep. I've just gratuitously dropped our um, view towards an early federal election slide in as well. We were, I was going to give us a break from that today, but um, the majority of people say they don't want it, whether that affects their vote or not. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Kevin Hayes. He says, the budget seems to be okay on the quantitative side of things, but poorly on the qualitative side, by which he means the cash flash does not seem to improve the real social and productivity and educational engagement, environmental concerns. So the question is, how can we better raise, uh, I think, Richard, probably this is where you talk about the shape of the economy and not the, the size of GDP, uh, so maybe to you first on that one. Yeah, look, we, we always talk about how big the economy is and we just, you know, bigger must be better. But if the economy is big because we're uh, spending more money on car crashes or spending lots of money uh, causing environmental harm and air pollution that we then have to spend a lot of money on health to fix, uh, that's a different kind of big than if we're spending a lot of money on uh, better aged care and better childcare. So when we talk about the economy, the indicators trap us into focusing on size when it's actually the shape of the economy that affects employment, the shape of our economy that affects our well-being. And the same is true for government spending. Um, you can drop $100 billion in tax cuts on high income earners and not stimulate nearly as much economic activity as if you drop $100 billion into labour intensive services like health and education and aged care. But again, we're trained to look at, you know, big kids look at the big picture. So we're trained to look at GDP. That's a big kid question. And we're trained to look at the size of the budget deficit or the amount of government spending. That's a big, big, big kid question. But actually the composition of those things, the shape matters far more for our lives and far more for economic prosperity going forward. But granular detail, that's a small kid problem. And uh, our, our debate keeps driving us up into the abstract. And, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, economic growth didn't make people as happy as it should have because yeah. we, were, we were growing the bits of the economy they didn't want. Yeah, Catherine, the budget was really, it had to tackle quite a few big structural issues, women's economic security, uh, as Richard's already kind of touched on, the Aged Care Royal Commission recommended, uh, I think, about three times the amount of spending that was actually delivered in the budget. But it did really, I mean, it wasn't a small spending budget, but it hasn't really fixed any of those long-term structural problems either. Yeah, well, it is it is a lot of cash and it's sort of interesting in um, one of the charts, I don't think we quite got to, but um, with the aged care spend, which is $18 billion, um, I, I totally accept the point that it, that uh, the government has not delivered the full uh, blueprint handed down by the Royal Commission, despite appearances to the contrary, and in fact has, has departed from it in a lot of significant ways. But still, $18 billion over the forwards is, is a big wad of money, um, yet people in our poll uh, this fortnight don't aren't really sure the government's got a plan. So that's quite interesting to me. That, uh, that something that large in in coalition terms, in terms of a of an unfunded spend over the forward estimates, hasn't sort of made the good people of Australia turn around and say, oh, actually, the government's got a clear plan for the Aged Care Royal Commission. I saw that response in the budget. So um, anyway, a way to go with all of these initiatives. And, and the point is that... Um, uh, you know, we get back to Richard's point, which is about the stage three tax cuts, like the government's setting up a proposition where the budget desperately needs revenue for a bunch of things that need to happen in, in policy terms and to develop and maximise the economy and participation in new industries, etc. Uh, at the same time that the government's setting up to deprive the government, uh, the budget of revenue. And that is, that is a conundrum that we can't just shrug off. That is, that's a, that's, a big problem that somebody is going to have to confront at some stage um, and, you know, whomever wins the next election won't be able to kind of duck that point, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, the next question I've got is from Ken. He says, what does the panel think could be done to change the public's attitude to those who are trapped in poverty? Uh, I'm not sure that the polling spoke to that in particular, but Richard, do you want to kind of reflect on 
those in poverty, perhaps those who are stuck now on job seeker, which is once again under the poverty line and whether or not the pandemic and so many people losing their jobs through literally no fault of their own has shifted things or should? Uh, look, ab- absolutely. There's no doubt that the public were quite sympathetic to people who, quote, lost their job through no fault of their own during the crisis. That was great. There was a political moment there, so much so that we had to be temporarily nice to the unemployed. Well, that didn't last long because victim blaming is at the heart of Australian policy and politics. Uh, to, to harp on the tax the stage three tax cuts, the Prime Minister will tell you that we have to cut taxes for people earning over $200,000 a year because if we don't increase their disposable income, they won't work hard. But for low-income workers, we, we don't need to give them a pay rise to encourage them to work hard. So in, in Australia, the wealthy need income incentive effects to motivate them and the poor need fear to motivate them. They need to worry about how uh, how terrible the unemployment benefit is if they fall out of their job, whereas high income earners need a tax cut to encourage them to keep doing their job. So uh, look, it's a great question, uh, but I guess I reject the premise. I don't think anyone's terribly keen in this government uh, on making people sympathetic to those in need. Uh, it's better that we mistrust them and then we can all punch down and think that it's, it's the it's the unemployed that are greedy in Australia, you know, not 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 people about to get a nine thousand dollar a year tax cut. Yeah, Catherine, did you want to reflect on that at all? Mm, we sort of, yeah, we're kind of tracking back into the the whole sort of dynamics of this sort of shifted a bit during the pandemic, and now we're shifting back into more normal framing, normal times, and by that I mean. Uh, I heard the Prime Minister say yesterday for the first time in many, many months, you've got to have a go to get a go, which, uh, <laughs> which I thought was had been retired. I thought that that, uh, that locution had been retired, but evidently not. You've got to have a go to get a go. So, um, yeah, we're sort of back into more normal territory. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the government is suggesting that it has a formula of cut taxes, economic growth takes off, uh, prosperity reigns from the heavens, um, you know, isn't that all marvellous, um, except uh, evidence suggests probably doesn't work. But anyway, yeah, I just, I'd just just say quickly rather than bog us down that, yeah, we're entering a more normal season of the discussion of, sadly, low-income people and poverty in the country and who might be responsible for their own circumstances. So it sounds like to... have a go, get a go, didn't die of COVID, as we all hope. <laughs> But, but it's interesting to reflect that we're moving back to the old economic arguments, but with the under, like with the a new, a new scaffold of stimulus That's- is what the government does. And so, you know, we've been 30 years where effectively the um, right of centre parties won the economic argument around small government and deregulation. And even with these debates playing out, it feels to me that there has been this sea change that when things got really bad, it was government is there to provide services to regulate and to stimulate. um, And that is now the new role for government. So I am really interested to see how those old debates play out in the new paradigm where, Mm -hmm. you know, and again, I guess if you want to be optimistic for Labor, their model of government has now won the moment. And so whether, you know, maybe that's where Albo's talking about kicking with the breeze. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask. the model is there, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask to wrap up, Peter, and I might start with you. If everyone in perhaps a, a minute or so, um, I've got a three or more questions in the Q&A about where the opportunities are for Labor Um, given that we are headed to an election with, you know, fairly different uh, economic grounds and things like that. Um, So just, I guess, a reflection on where the opportunities might be uh, for Labor and how we think it might try and differentiate itself. And someone in here has mentioned um, Jim Chalmers at the press club kind of looking to the Biden administration um, in terms of, you know, taxation on multinationals and other avenues. So just a reflection from the panel, starting with Pete on, um, yeah, given what we've discussed today, where we think Labor might go in the lead up to the election. So it is a difficult needle to thread, but if you do accept that premise that the orthodoxies change, 
why would you go with the mob that don't believe in it when you've got the mob that has made it their political project? Um, the challenge for Labor is to bring life into that discussion and not just do it in a boring transactional sort of way, but to actually show how government does deliver solutions to how plans do deliver public outcomes. And as our stats have shown today, I think there is an audience ready to hear that um, if Labor can, can trust um, that it's won um, the intellectual debate, even though it's really, really hard to be in opposition. Yeah. Yeah, hard for oppositions all around at the moment. Catherine, what about you? I mean, picking up on that last point, incumbency is very powerful, uh, and we've seen that in every election contest around the world, except the American election, when uh, when voters decided that Donald Trump had been so manifestly incompetent that they couldn't stand him anymore. So um, obviously you do get marked down if you screw things up. So um, that sort of leads back to the point I was trying to make a minute ago that uh, that Labor is sort of standing at the at, at the cliff top at the moment, wondering how far to push in terms of the government's record on a couple of key things. And I suspect they're sort of, yeah, that's a, that's a kind of dialogue they're having with themselves. How do you, how do you push? Um, in terms of the new rules, um, uh, that's also a thing too, and Pete's right to point that out. Um, also, I think, uh, look, I think it's going to be very hard for Labor to win the next election. I do. I think it's, it is going to be very difficult. But um, I think the, government, the government's actions tell us that they think there's a contest. Uh, the government uh, created that budget, the, all that social spending, because they didn't want to fight on the territory that Pete just mapped out, which is the sort of, um, you know, government is a, is a beneficial presence in your life frame. They didn't want to do that. So they've, they've kind of tried to cut labour off at the, cut the labour election off at, a, at the pass by being a bit like Labor themselves. That's interesting to me. So the, the government thinks there's a contest, whether or not the government, uh, whether or not Labor can win it, I think it's very hard, um, but, uh, but they, uh, you know, they'll either win it or not based on the choices that they're gonna make, I think, over the next few weeks. Mm, okay. And Richard, final thoughts from you. Uh, look, very much agree with what Catherine just said. I, I think it's very hard for Labor in, in many ways, same with what Pete said, but taking that sort of standing at the cliff analogy, um, I think one thing Labor has to think is, do they want to talk about the past or do they want to talk about the future? There's going to be a temptation to say, look what we did and we were right, but I think people care more about what's going to happen than, than who, don't get me wrong, Labor were right <laughs> 10 years ago, but I don't know that people care as much. Um uh, I think Scott Morrison's fundamental weakness is delivery. Uh, he, not, I don't mean delivering lines. I mean delivering outcomes. You know, he's the guy that's got an answer for everything and a solution for nothing. And, and people feel that. People know that. So I think the opportunity for Labor is to kind of say, look, welcome to our worldview, Prime Minister. Good with the spending. Good with the, you know, the stimulus. Great. But let's face it, you can't roll out anything. You know, you can't roll out quarantine. You can't roll out vaccine. We don't trust you to spend the money well on aged care. So I think that the, it's, a bit, it's a bit boring, but I actually think, and I think Anthony Albanese does this quite well, he's always putting it back on the government saying, look how they stuffed it up. Don't ask me, ask the government why they stuffed it up. So I think the, the size of the spending, all that fiscal policy debate is going to be hard terrain for Labor but reminding people that you can't actually trust Scott Morrison. He doesn't deliver on anything. Like he'll change his mind at the drop of a hat and his back catalogue is, is a litany of over-promise and under-delivery. Mm. Well, I guess we'll see uh, if that's the path that Labor chooses to go down soon. We'll have to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Catherine Murphy, Pete Lewis, Richard Dennis and John Remington for joining us today. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. We had about 400 people on the line with us today. Uh, and a reminder that tomorrow and Friday, we have two more exciting webinars coming up. Tomorrow at three o'clock, we'll be talking about the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons with uh, a number of panellists uh, who are well-versed in
in the subject. So please join us for that. And on Friday, we'll be talking uh, again with Pete Lewis and with the Human Rights Commissioner, Ed Santo, at one o'clock in the afternoon. You can find the details to register for those uh, events on our website. And a reminder that, yeah, they are for free, uh, but registration is essential. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we will wrap it up there and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks time when we'll be back again for Pole Position on Australia Institute TV. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Ed.